So I think it's a good time for us to start our talk now. So good evening, everyone. I'm Natalie from Kadui Farm and Botanic Garden. And welcome everyone to our second talk on our talk this year under the Kadui Earth Program 2023 talk series by international ecological speakers. And today we are very honored to have Dr. Vandana Shiver to be with us for this talk. We are seed, we are soil, we are shati. As well as to have our facilitator, Shen Heng, Shen Heng to be with us. So just to briefly introduce Shen Heng as well. Shen Heng is living in an emerging eco community in Lamchong, Lam Chong. And she, the peop she and other people living in that eco community, they are still practicing organic farming, holistic life, and ecological education in this small eco-village there. So may I now pass the time to our facilitator, Shen Heng, and she will talk more about this talk as well as introducing our speaker today, Vandana Shiver. So Shen Heng, please. Okay. Hello, everybody. Since we are in the different in different parts of the world, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. <laughs> so welcome online. Yeah, and uh, and I'm Shen Hing uh, from Hong Kong. Yeah, I'm very honored to be the facilitator for this talk. Yeah. Um, first of all, let me uh, introduce the Kaduri Earth Program (KEP). Yeah. Um, Kaduri Earth Program is an initiative that integrates various uh, strands of KB, KFPG's nature's conservation, sustainable living, and holistic education programs to let our participants reconnect with themselves, each other, and the rest of nature. Enable them to cultivate resilience in the face of climate change, economic uncertainty, and other related challenges and guide them to experience a paradigm shift. Yeah. Um, now, I would like to introduce Dr. Vandana Shiva. Yeah. Um, since Dr. Vandana Shiva's work is so well known all over the world, I don't need to go into the details of her background, her long-term endeavor in ecology and her 27 books. Well, I really count them <laughs> uh, when I search in the website. Yeah. Um, we have never met. Yeah. And I would like to introduce her by saying a few words about my spiritual connection with Dr. Shiver. Yeah. Um, the first book I read about ecofeminism is called, written by uh, Dr. Shiver and named Ecofeminism. Yeah, published in 1993. Um, so when I was teaching gender and feminism courses in England University in the 1990s and onwards, I often introduced to students about India's ecological activism by actions taken by Dr. Shiva and other women and activists, including the Embracing Trees movement back in the 1970s. Yeah, all my students remember this uh, movement <laughs> when I mentioned that uh, later on. Yeah. And her later endeavor in biodiversity movement, her sharp critique about agribusiness, GM seeds, globalization and multinational companies, bioprivacy, etc and her advocacy for earth democracy, third world positioning, reclaiming the commons, soil, not oil, and so on, always impressed it and inspired me a lot. So I'm very much agreed with uh, Asia Weeks calling her one of the five most powerful communicators in Asia. Mm. Yeah. So um, before introducing, uh, before uh, inviting Dr. Shiva to talk, uh, maybe I just have a few logistic uh, things to mention, uh, a few things to note. Yeah. Mm. 
uh, first of all, um, you are encouraged to keep your camera on during the talk. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, if you have uh, questions in mind while uh, listening to the talk, you just uh, note it down first. Yeah, and uh, just write the questions when the Q&A time um, is open. Yeah, so you can write it uh, in the chat box. And thirdly, um, there is simultaneous uh, Chinese interpreting uh, provided uh, both in Putonghua and in Cantonese. So you can uh, click the interpretation uh, icon and then you can have that surface. Yep, so that's it. Um, so today we are very honored uh, to have Dr. Schiffer here to talk to us on we are seed, we are soil, we are Shakti. So Dr. Schiffer, please. Thank you so much, Jilling, and greetings to all of you who have joined uh, the session of We Are Nature. Thank you also to the Kaduri Farms and uh, uh, Center for organizing the series and inviting me. I have been active in the ecology movement since the days of Chipko, the beautiful movement of hugging. And from my childhood itself, I did not suffer the illusion that we are separate from nature. I grew up in the forest of the Himalaya and knew every moment that we are the earth, we are nature, we are the trees that give us breath. We are the forests that give us water. Um, we are the seed and we are the soil. These are lessons I have learned over my lifetime. But even in my academic studies, I decided to focus on the non-mechanistic sciences of quantum theory, because the idea that the world is a machine, the mechanistic worldview, never made sense to me. And to me, it was a very, very narrow understanding of the way the world works, a very, very narrow understanding of how nature is organized. Uh, tuning is man, you know, I wrote Ecofeminism with Maria Mies, who sadly passed away last month on the 16th, uh, or this month actually, 16th of uh, May. And um, I remember her with a lot of fondness. But before that I had written Staying Alive, and staying alive was really about, you know, not just the story of Chipko, but all the other movements that the women of India were leading and changing our worldview. And at that time, I realized that something wrong with the way we think of science, because my quantum understanding showed that everything is interconnected, non-locality, non-separation, interconnectedness is the nature of the quantum world. My life's experience was showing me that, you know, the trees are connected to the water in the stream. And that's what the women of Chipko became very aware of. Uh, I remember a particular incident where they came out with lanterns to protect a forest. And the police was there and the forest officials were there and they said, you stupid women, can't you see that the sun is out? And they said, the lanterns are not for the sun, they're for you. Because you're so blind. You think these are timber mines. You think these forests are just this much square foot of timber, just this many rupees of revenue. But these forests are our life, they are our mothers. They give us soil and water and air and bread. And it took the government a few years to realize that this was the highest ecological science, the interconnectedness. And after we had horrible floods in 78, the government had to start listening more carefully. That the forests provide us soil stability, water stability. And, and then because of the Chipko movement in 1981, in the high Himalaya, logging was banned. 
how did we start thinking of forests as this much square foot of timber, rivers as this much kilowatt of energy, soil as this much acreage as real estate? When I wrote Staying Alive, I went into the paradigm of mechanistic thought. Where did it come from? How was it articulated? And, and in writing Staying Alive, I read every book that is called a book by the founders of modern science, particularly Mr. Bacon. We know the world is interconnected. We know that we are alive because nature is alive and we are part of the earth. We are made of the same elements that the earth is made of. The earth of the water, the fire, the air, the space. And for me, living is participation in the processes of the living earth. It's participating in the flows of breath that come from the trees to us in the form of oxygen. It's participating in the water cycle that connects the earth, the soil, and us. It is part of the cycle of nourishment and nutrition. I see food as a currency of life because the a basic ecological cycle is the nutrition cycle. Nutrition cycle basically means the cycle of food. And the cycle of food moves from the soil to the plants, to the animals, including humans. And this cycle, circulates nourishment. And it doesn't circulate nourishment in a static way. It circulates nourishment in a creative, dynamic, evolutionary way. We know we are soil, not only because we come from soil and we go back to soil, but because every minute when we are eating, we are transforming soil into ourselves, our blood, our brain. Scientists are now recognizing that the connection between the living soil, the plants, and our gut microbiome is the key to health. Our ancient systems of Chinese medicine and Ayurveda medicine understood that the gut is the key. But the gut was forgotten because nature was forgotten and food was forgotten and our bodies were forgotten. They were turned into massive, passive objects. The body of women, the bodies of the earth were transformed into inactive raw material and objectification. And this transformation from terra madri, the living earth, to terra nullius, the empty earth, which was the legal jurisprudence through which colonialism was established. When Captain Cook landed in Australia, he declared the land is empty. Aboriginals don't exist because they're not part of the humanity. They're part of the fauna and flora. East India Company colonized China, colonized India. We were not considered fully human. We were barbarians. Taking our land, our territories, our wealth was defined as a right. The connection between colonialism and a mechanistic reductionist way of thinking and calling it science, all were born at the same time. Francis Bacon, who's called the father of modern science, was the chancellor of England around the time this colonization was taking place. And this philosophy of mechanistic science aided colonization. And the colonization was not just of territories, colonization was of cultures, colonization was of women, colonization was of other races, other religions. Bacon actually wrote a book which he called The Birth of Masculine Time. Before that, he defined knowledge as effeminate. And in the masculine birth of time, he writes, I am come to you in the very truth, leading to you nature with all her children, 
to bind her to your service and make her your slave. That was the agenda of the mechanistic philosophy. And the church joined hand with science. Francis Boyle, who was the New England governor, but also a scientist, because he said, the idea that we must have respect for nature, the idea that we are part of nature, it is an interference in establishing our empire over the world. So the idea that we are part of nature, the idea that we are not superior to other species and Europeans were not superior to other cultures. This is what I have called ecological apartheid. Apartheid is the Afrikaans word for separateness, for separation, but with separation, superiority of one over the other. We were made separate from nature with the kind of thinking that went into mechanizing of thinking about our relationship to the earth. The soil was reduced to an empty vessel. When India was made the first experiment of the so-called green revolution, which was not green, it was not revolutionary. In the 60s, 66, the chemical agriculture was introduced in India in the name of the Green Revolution through the World Bank, the USAID, the Rockefeller Foundation. Together, they basically said, we have to sell our chemicals. They therefore changed the plants because our indigenous seeds did not adapt to chemicals. They rebelled, they rejected the chemicals. They launched. So Norman Borlaug, who was given a Nobel Prize for the Green Revolution, took stolen wheat from Japan during the war called Norin. And other scientists took stolen rice from Indonesia called Dejan Wu, which were dwarf varieties and then crossed them so that with, with these dwarf varieties, we could pump more fertilizer. That's how the changing of the seed began. Till that time, seed was free. Till that time, seed was not just the freedom of biodiversity to evolve, to multiply, to renew. Seed was the very basis of life. For me, seed is the future. It's the potential. It holds within itself millions and billions of years of the Earth's evolution. And it holds within itself thousands of years of agricultural innovation, largely by women, but by small farmers everywhere. Let me just give you two examples. The Indica varieties of rice evolved in India. We are the Vavilok center of the Indica varieties. Our peasants evolved 200,000 varieties of rice from one grass. Just imagine how much creativity and innovation that takes. And when I realized I had to save seeds, and I realized I had to save seeds because I was invited to a meeting on biotechnology in 1987, where the chemical industry was present. And I'd done my book on the Green Revolution. So I knew that changing the seed changes the farming system. It creates monocultures. It makes diversity disappear. But now they wanted to directly genetically manipulate the seed. And they said clearly at this meeting, it was not about feeding the world. They said it is about owning the seed so that they can have patents on seed. A patent is a right to exclusive use because you have invented something. Now, it was an outrage for me to have the Monsantos of the world declare that the seed is a machine that they have invented because seed is the very basis of life. I have watched our farmers evolve seed, save it, share it in freedom. A patent on seed, which is declared as a machine invented by the chemical companies, in effect is also a criminalization of the farmers, the right to save and exchange seed, an ultimate duty 
is made a crime. It's made an intellectual property theft. And that's the day I started to say, commit myself to saving seed. I didn't know anything about seed, but over the years, I've learned from the seed and I've learned we are seed. We are seed because the seed makes us and we protect the seed. We are the seed because I've realized that so much of the disease is coming from we have for the fact that for green revolution we bred for chemicals. For GMOs, we bred for glyphosate, Roundup Ready crops, sell more chemicals. The impact has been that in effect, our food has become nutritionally empty, but full of toxins. So nutritional emptiness causes one set of diseases. Zinc deficiency causes depression, magnesium deficiency causes attention deficit or disorder, iron deficiency causes anemia. And our work in Navdanya, and I hope that some of you can at some time visit our Navdanya Earth University. In uh, September, we do a whole month of the living seed, living soil, living food, living economies, working with the earth to regenerate the earth and grow more food and address climate change and protect the biodiversity and regenerate the biodiversity. We save seeds. We have 750 varieties of rice we are planting on our farm now. But across the different community seed banks, we've saved more than 4,000 varieties of rice in different community seed banks. Together, that's that 4,000 varieties of rice. Among them are salt tolerant rices that help us deal with the cyclone from the Bay of Bengal. Drought tolerant rices, flood tolerant rices that are able to deal with the flooding in the Ganges Basin. In fact, we have rices that used to grow in the flood and used to be harvested by boat. And I'm sure if you start looking in your areas where you come from, you will find similar diversity, richness, innovation, creation. Farmers have been innovators, but they did not innovate for destructiveness, for monocultures, for chemicals. They innovated for maximizing life. Now research, including research we've done, is showing, first, that native seeds are more nutritionally dense. So measuring the weight is an irrelevant criteria in seeds. Measuring the nutrition is what matters. And across the board, native seeds are more nutrition. But because native seeds come from the soil and they work with the living soil, the living soil provides more nourishment. The reason chemically grown food is nutritionally empty is because the soil has been emptied of nutrition. With chemical fertilizers, the soil become deserts. The minute you give back to the earth in gratitude, you say, I am part of you. Thank you for the abundance you give me. And I give back a little organic matter in hundreds of ways of returning organic matter to the soil, of composting, of green manuring. The food for the microbes become the basis of the future future food. And, and our research is showing that compared to chemical farms and, and organic farms, the soil organic matter has gone up 100%. Nitrogen. You apply urea in the soil, your nitrogen goes down. You don't apply urea, but let the earthworms work, your nitrogen goes up. Living soil is the key to the food system, but not just the food system, in my view, it is the key to regenerating the climate system. During questions, I'm more than happy to share some of these details that are in my book, Soil Not Oil, and a lot of in our research. Zinc has gone up 40%. In the chemical soils, it's down 27%. Our soils give on nitrogen, um, uh, they give iron, they give magnesium. It's the soil organisms that are giving this food. Organic foods are rich in phytochemicals. 
those rich phytochemicals is what our gut requires because our gut is a hundred trillion microbes. Each of those microbes has a distinctive diet. So China, East Asia is the land where soya bean became a very big basis to food. During the wars, soya bean was taken to America initially as animal feed, but later also for oil. Oil would be taken in that and the remains would be given to it for oil. They used to use the solvent extraction system, a very violent system where you heat the oil at 400 degrees centigrade. And that's why these industrial oils are so harmful for health. But soya bean has now been patented hundreds of times over. I call these biopiracy. Our basmati rice was patented before that case. Our ancient wheats were patented before that. Our knowledge that trees like neem allow us to control pests. That was patented. I fought that case for 11 years in the European Patent Office. And eventually we defeated the US government and the company called WR Grace. WR Grace does not exist anymore. And it took three women, friendship, trust, and mutual support. Fight this case for 11 years. Healthy soils make us, they make civilization. They don't just make our individual health. They establish the connection between sustainability and extinction. As one of our ancient Vedas says, in this handful of soil is your future. Take care of it. It will take care of you. It'll provide you with food, clothing, shelter, and beauty. Destroy it. It will destroy you. We've done many manifestos on the fact that there's so many displaced people in the world. Of course, wars are a very big reason for displacement, but desertification of soils is a big reason for displacement. And desertification is because we've stopped taking care of the soil. We've take, stopped remembering we are part of the soil. We have a manifesto called Terra Viva, our soil, our commons, our future, which we wrote in the year of the soil in, 19, in 2015. And, uh, and we realized that so many places, you know, that's the time where the boats were sinking in, uh, in the Mediterranean as the boats were crossing. So which were the communities in these boats? People from Africa, people from Syria, from Afghanistan. Syria, the, you know, in Syria, it's, it's part of the Fertile Crescent. It is where crops like wheat and rye and barley were domesticated. In fact, the big seed bank for this region used to be in uh, Aleppo in Syria. It's being bombed during the Syrian war. The Iraq seed bank was turned into a prison. And it was made illegal to use native seeds by Iraqi Order 81. In Syria, they weren't allowed to use their own seeds. They had to use the varieties bred for chemicals. But as I said, the chemicals destroy the soil. But chemical farming requires 10 times more water. So water in this dry area, few wells were do. when the drought took place, the tubers went dry, there was a disaster. 75% animals died, crops failed, farmers moved into the city and asked for help. I don't know how many of you are aware that there's something called structural adjustment that is applied to countries by the World Bank and IMF after they get you into debt. 
First, they give you loans for things you don't need, for chemical fertilizers, for green revolution, for more highways, for more ports. And then they tell you, now you have a debt and we will have to change your economy so we can squeeze more money out of you. This is called structural adjustment. So Syria was going through a structural adjustment and one element of the structural adjustment is you cannot support your farmers. So the government was not allowed to support its farmers for a crisis created by imposing the wrong seats. And before you knew it, the Syrian war had started. Hundreds of players, it's still carrying on, but it all begins with seed. Because seed is what makes communities self-reliant or dependent. Seed is what makes fertile, soil fertile or dead. Seed is what makes human communities healthy or full of disease. Healthy soils are full of biodiversity, which maintains the planet's health by participating in and maintaining the carbon and nitrogen cycle. One little gram of living soil contains one billion bacteria, consisting of tens of thousands of taxa, 200 fungal hyphae. The key, the fungal hyphae, the mycorrhizae are the secret to living soil. One cubic inch of soil holds eight miles of this hyphae, which can go far away and find the nourishment that a plant needs and brings it. It's not the chemicals that feed the plant, it's the soil fungi that feeds the plant. And new research is showing that the more fungi they are, the healthier the plant, the more photosynthesis it can do, the more food it can produce, the more carbon dioxide it can fix. All the cycles start getting healed. One teaspoon of living soil contains six billion microorganisms, including one billion bacteria which translates into one ton per acre. One square cubic meter contains 100 earthworms, 50,000 insects, 12 trillion roundworms. We are talking about an amazing soil. Scientists are now talking about the soil food web. They're talking about the worldwide web in the soil, which has more neurological activity going on than all of the internet in the world. You know, each root is interacting through neurological systems with all the fungi, with all the bacteria. And this living soil is what we are, both because we participate and co-create with it. When we give love and we give care to the soil, the soil becomes living and living soil gives us an abundance. When we save the seeds, one little mustard seed gives you a thousand seed. One little millet seed gives you a hundred thousand seed. Million comes from the Latin, which stands for hundred thousand. That's why the family of crops is called millets. You know, when I started saving seeds, the literature from the Green Revolution used to call it primitive crops, obsolete crops. And another funny word, because the seeds of millets are very tiny and they used to call it the coarse grain, big grain. No, it has very small grain. And it can provide 400 times more nutrition to people if we were growing the millets. My work in India has shown me that 70% of the diet used to be millets till the Green Revolution. And it was displaced to sell fertilizer and the Green Revolution rice and wheat varieties. The food basket, which is such a wide basket, we used to eat 10,000 varieties of plants. And in each, we had so much diversity. It was shrunk into two or three varieties of rice, two or three varieties of wheat. No wonder there's malnutrition. And people keep saying, oh, we grow more food. I said, food is all of the food that a biodiverse systems can grow. And of, and food is all of the nourishment 100 trillion microbes in our gut require. That's food. That is diversity. Food is not commodities in the market. 90% of the 
of the crops growing from Roundup resistant corn and soya in the world, which is the largest acreage. The Amazon is being cut for the GMO soya. All of Argentina has been destroyed for GMO soya. All of the Midwest of America is destroyed for GMO soya. 90% of this is not food for people. It's biofuel to drive cars. It is animal feed for the factory farms, which are a very big problem, both in terms of, also in terms of separating animals from crops because the two must have symbiosis. So what I've learned over these many years is that the earth is living. We are part of this living earth. We are alive because the earth gives us life, it gives us the breath, it gives us the water, it gives us the food. It gives us our identity. We are earth citizens. We are earth beings. We are citizens of countries after that. We are members of religions after that. What we share across the board with other species is that we are of the earth and we are related to the earth and we are part of the earth. We cannot separate ourselves from the earth. We'd be dead. You know, a lot of, uh, you know, people think that when you industrialize society, you somehow depend less on nature. Now my understanding and all my research over 50 years tells me the more you industrialize, the more your ecological footprint, because you remove yourself from the earth cycles. The earth cycles provide everything you need and you work according to those cycles. You need nothing from outside. You work outside those cycles, you have to have huge ecological footprint. And that ecological footprint is usually in other places, in the colonies. So you don't see it as, you know, in the rich countries, they don't see the footprint of their consumption. That footprint comes to our countries. And there's new research showing that if you take consumption into account, 99% of the greenhouse gases are coming from the rich countries because I did a study in soil, not oil, I've cited this, 80% of what Walmart sells in America is made in China. Now, should that be counted as an ecological footprint of China or should it be counted as the consumption footprint in America? These are the issues that we have to address in our times because climate, is going to be a very confused area. I've been part of the biodiversity lawmaking and the climate lawmaking since the 1992 treaties were signed at the Earth Summit. We have worked in solutions. We have shown that with biodiverse ecological farming, we don't just grow more food. As we measure nutrition per acre and not yield per acre, our work is showing that the more you conserve biodiversity and intensify biodiversity, you grow more nutrition, not commodities that grow for biofuel and animal feed, but nutrition that is nourishing people. We could provide India two times the nourishment it needs and not have anyone malnourished. If we work with the living seed and we work with the living soil and we work recognizing that we are seed and we are soil and we are the creative power of the earth, the creative power of women, for which there's a very beautiful word in Sanskrit and in India called Shakti. Shakti means the power to act. We are not passive second sex. We are not a dead earth. We are a creative force in this universe. But because patriarchy and capitalist patriarchy and the greed economy define extraction as creation, it's defined domination as creation. It defined destruction as creation. It became blind to the power of the living seed and the power of the living soil and the power of creative women. So we have to reclaim our Shakti, but just as the power to flow through the systems, whether it be the breath, or it be the water, or it be food, or it be energy, 
This flow is what is the interconnectedness of life. And that flow is the flow of Shakti, of the creative power of the universe. And we are part of it. And therefore our power to act in ways that heals the earth, in ways that regenerates the earth, in ways that rebuilds community and rebuilds society, that is in our hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Shivas. Um, uh, give us a very, um, from the historical, yeah, about her own personal growth uh, in, in the Himalayas and all the way down to how globalizations and then the um, green revolutions really destroyed what we have and then how we should um, claim back the last uh, statement that uh, um, her is to reclaim our Shakti, right? Yeah. And uh, to rebuild the earth, to rebuild the community. Yeah. I think that's a very um, important directions for our action and creation. Yeah. Okay. So I think um, participants may have um, questions for uh, Dr. Shiver. Yeah. And then um, if you want to uh, ask questions, please just type in the chat box now. Uh, you can do that. And then I have one question uh, here in the chat box. Okay. You shall should. I read it? Yeah. yeah sure. Read it out. Okay. So uh, it is from uh, a friend called Bob C. Yeah. And said, dear Vandana Shiva, it is an honor to listen to you, to your talk, and it's good to be here. In the opening to your talk this evening, you described the materialism mechanistic paradigm that has dominated our institutions globally ever since the scientific revolution of Bacon, Descartes, and Newton. So are you witnessing today the emergency the emergence of a consciousness paradigm to replace the outdated material materialism paradigm? Are you optimistic that we still have enough time to shift consciousness? So, <laughs> you know, the shift in con consciousness is instantaneous. You know, it's not a, a process that takes forever. Um, and that shift in consciousness is taking place, not only because, you know, 100 years ago, quantum theory shifted our consciousness to the recognition that everything is interconnected. But what connects us is consciousness, not separate particles. Separate particles can't be connected. Mm -hmm. Separation of Newtonian mechanistic physics Baconian mechanistic physics is built into the idea that the world is made of particles or society is made of individuals and they cannot be connected. It's by force. Action by contact, it's called. Whereas in the quantum world, where there are no discrete particles, it's one minute of wave, one minute of particle, but what's common between the wave and the particle? So many scientists recognize it to be consciousness. For example, the fact in quantum theory, the observer makes, influences what is observed. There's nothing like an inanimate nature out there. So from the quantum world, conscious, consciousness has been rising. It's just that for some reason, quantum theory, you know, I mean, they want to make quantum computers but they cannot bring consciousness into their thinking of what does quantum theory teach us. But there is a new wave of, of an ecological biology that is realizing that life is living. It's not machines. 
Nothing is a machine. This love for the machine that was created by the mechanistic philosophy, it's a totally in the head. Living systems are self-organized, creative, intelligent, conscious. I've just done a forward to a very beautiful book that a scientist has put together. It's called Biocivilization. And he's taken different parts of the living world from the ants to the bees, to the butterflies, to uh, the bacteria. And these studies are showing all these species are conscious and they're sentient, they're intelligent. Mechanistic philosophy didn't just turn us in, you know, they defined humans as superior to other species, but they basically robbed other species of consciousness and of, of intelligence. And that's bursting forth right now. Um, so wherever there is no corporate control, you know, science is done for corporate control, whether it be big pharma or it be big ag, that is where the biology gets messed up, messed up into a mechanistic thing. That there's a master molecule called the DNA that instructs everything. And there's a central dogma that dictates. All cooked up. Life is complexity in beautiful harmony and self-organization. And that independent science is growing by the day. So I do feel, I mean, I've never not been optimistic, you know? I, I cultivated optimism, I cultivate hope. I do the things that create hope, not just for me, but around me. And I do that by realizing that we have to give up our anthropocentric arrogance. We were made to put ourselves at the center of creation. And in the process, we forgot that we are one strand in the web of life. And a strand in the web of life, we are dependent on all other parts of the web of life. And that brings us humility. I always say we are not atlases carrying the earth on our shoulder. The earth carries us and we must walk lightly with the earth. And if we realize we are a strand in the web of life, instead of human arrogance, anthropocentric arrogance, trying to not just dominate the earth in exploitation, but even in false solutions like on climate change, geoengineering the planet, engineering our food, that arrogance dissipates. And the minute you realize you're part of an amazing cre creative universe, you know, that hope, hope comes from there. I want to read out from this book I just mentioned by a civilization. Um, you know, I've talked about Earth's democracy. You mentioned my book, Earth Democracy. He talks about Gaia and democracy. Same thing, that we are part of the Earth and our freedom is connected to the freedom of other life. And this to me is a source of optimism. He says, when the human universe opens to the universe of our planetary relatives, which is all other life, we become citizens of a biological multiverse who now embrace the future with a sense of wonder and responsibility never experienced before. It is a time for wonder and hope. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot for the um, great answer. Um, so, um, there is another question from Sachin Fred Hen, yeah. Um, said, so thank you for the powerful words. I have admirer of your work through your interviews and talks. Yeah. Um, there are two questions. First, what are the thoughts about Safe Soil Initiative of Isha Foundation? And are you collaborating with Isha on this? This is the first question. The second question is, do you see link in mental disease epidemic during this decade and GMO and erosion of soil? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we've been working on living soil since I started work on ecological agriculture. That's from 1984 onwards when the disasters in Punjab and 
Bhopal with the pesticide plant league, pushed me into looking for an agriculture that does not cause harm. Uh, mm. So I'm very glad the Isha Foundation has picked up the issue of soil recently. They're a very, very big foundation. We are a very, very small organization. Mm. You know, uh, some of their people come to, you know, uh, come and visit us. And, you know, we are more than happy to collaborate at that level, but not if we don't have any partnership institutionally. In terms of the mental illness, I want to share with you, I want to share with you some figures. One moment. So the question was asked about, is there a connection between growing mental illnesses and soil and seeds that kill the soil? Yeah. Uh, I think there is because mental illness takes two forms. One is direct things like depression, things like, um, uh, um, attention deficit. I mentioned this earlier, that our studies are showing that our, the chemical soils are losing zinc. I had a public health doctor visit us from Australia. He's one of the lead, she's one of the leading public health doctors. And when she saw our data of how much organic soils increase the in fact, let me just share this with you. One moment, I'm reaching out for my literature on my table. Just two indicators. So zinc is down 37% in the chemical farms. This is over to 20 period study in our valley. 37.8% zinc on. And in the organically farmed farms, 14% increase. Now, for us, it's just zinc. She saw this data and said, now I understand what's happening. Because as a public health doctor, of course she works on public health. And she was finding that 15% of the teenagers of Australia are depressed. Hmm. And as a scientist, she does brain chemistry to understand, you know, what are the deficiencies that could be. And she found in all the young people who are depressed, a zinc deficiency. She said, this is why, because if your farming system is losing the zinc, how will you get it in your body? The same goes for manganese. The kids in America and England are, are given toxic legal drugs for something called attention deficit disorder. England had a program. There's a very famous chef in England who got a big grant to bring organic food to the schools. Now here were all these kids restless, inattentive, and they found that they all had magnesium deficiency. But when they got organic food, this deficiency was removed and their attention deficit went without drugs. But there's a second kind of problem, not in terms of the typical way we men mention mental disease, but neurological diseases. Neurological diseases, that ex explosion of autism, explosion of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, they're just exploding. It used to be one in 100,000 autistic kids in America. Now it's one in, in 40s or something like that. The costs of this annually worldwide, we've done this course in our book. We have a book called Biodiversity, Agroecology and Regenerative Organic Farming, where we synthesize all our research. The cost of neurodegenerative diseases totally linked to food, linked to our gut. Mm. Our gut is being called the second brain. So doctors are now realizing that the food we eat decides how the brain, how the gut functions, and how the gut functions decides how the brain. Functions. They're talking about a gut-brain axis. The cost of damage is 2.4 trillion. For autism, it's 171 billion. But of course, these problems can't be counted in terms of cost of money. So your, your question, I would say yes. Yes. Oh. There's a deep connection. 
Thank you very much. I think it's also an eye opening for me to know that yeah, that kind of the food that we eat in the in in our body that can really damage or, or something that we lack the thing the magnesium that you talk about will damage our brain and the neural system because depressed and then <laughs> yeah so there are mm, things that we we need to notice more yeah okay so um so there's a question from Leon Ivano Ma. Yeah. Where can we where can we reach out for legal assistance for granting legal rights to our ecosystems? Okay. <clears throat> so first we don't grant rights. You know, if, if the earth gives us life. We don't grant the earth rights. We recognize her rights. Mm. That she has rights. We might have been blind to her rights, but now we have to be awake to her rights. Mm. So I would suggest that you all look at, I'll give you a background story. In 2009, the climate summit was taking place in Copenhagen. And, the, you know, summits means heads of state come and they negotiate. And at this summit, President Obama flew in. He just received the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize. And he flew in and collected China, India, five big countries, and said, why do we have to obey these binding, you know, because UN treaties are binding, legally binding. So why should we obey all this? Let's just have voluntary commitments. And he killed the UNFCC legally binding arrangements. And then in the, because of the arrogance, I had a press conference and announced we've come to an agreement. Now this press conference was then boomed into the big hall where the negotiations were going on. And all of the third world participants are saying, but we are still negotiating. How can he say we've come to a conclusion? And then Eva Morales got up. He was then the president of Bolivia. He said, we were here to defend the rights of mother earth, not the rights of polluters. And I will continue this work. So he went back and he said he, he called a meeting of citizens of the world on, on rights of Mother Earth and climate change. And he created a group and we collectively drafted a universal declaration on the rights of Mother Earth. And we have put together a whole book on the issues of biodiversity and the rights of Mother Earth. It's called Origin, the Plunder of Nature and Culture and it has these rights. So when you talk about where do you turn to legal advice, mm -hmm. you turn to legal advice to the organizations that have been created around the rights of Mother Earth. In America, they were nervous about Mother Earth. They, so they said, we'll call it nature, rights of nature. In Australia, there are groups. There's an international network. I'm on steering committee called the Rights of Nature Alliance. And that's where one place you can go. But the one thing I would say is to avoid seriously never carry the anthropocentric arrogance that humans assign rights to nature. Nature comes first. Our rights flow from the earth. Second, do not give anthropocentric form to those rights. I'll give you an example. So some people, you know, there was a fashion going around about granting rights. And uh, I, I think a river in... Uh, New Zealand had been, you know, Waikiki River, but this was on the basis of the Maori movement and all, and there's a huge movement behind it. So in India, some people thought, oh, you know, easy way. So two cases were brought to the, to the high court of uh, my state, Uttarakhand. I, I'm from the Himalayan state of Uttarakhand. And one case said, they asked for, granting rights to the Ganges. Now, you know, Ganges for us is a sacred river. We call mm -hmm. her Mother Ganga, mm -hmm. you know, Ganga Ma. Uh, mm -hmm. She already has rights. It's just that we have started to violate those rights. We don't mm -hmm. respect her, we pollute her, but it's not that she doesn't have rights. Anyway, by taking this case to the court, what did the court decide? Mother Ganga was now reduced to a child 
who has to be taken care of by the parents' patriarch, it's a legal principle, where the state becomes the parent. Mm. And this, you know, when the Bhopal disaster happened, this is what happened. The state was de de defined as the parent of the victims and then came to this horrible settlement mm. that got nothing for the disaster to the victims. But this ruling declared the state that was polluting the river as the parent of the river, which is the mother. So it creates massive legal confusion. That's why we must go out of the anthropocentric paradigm into an ecocentric paradigm. And we'll have to, for that, actually change the Anglo-Saxon law, which is patriarchal, which is anthropocentric, which is oriented towards private property. Mm -hmm. And we have to be more innovative. And the way we've done it in India is we began from the grassroots of the community. We started to create a living democracy movement in 1999 on Environment Day. Communities would get together and declare these forests. We are part of these forests. We are part of these rivers. We are part of the animals in the forest. And it's our duty to protect them. Now, those were the days of where the you know, WTO patenting, all this was happening and piracy was happening. And something beautiful emerged out of this community initiatives. But you know, we also have thieves in our society, but we have a little hearing at the village level to ask what was their desperation? Why did they steal bread? What was their desperation? Why did they steal money? And if there's a serious reason, we forgive them and provide what they need. But if it's pure maliciousness, of course we give them an appropriate punishment. Because in village councils, they sit under the tree, you know, the banyan tree. So the community said, we are going to write to these companies that are stealing our resources. Monsanto for the wheat, rice tech for the basmati. And they send these postcards. It said, we understand you have a desperation. Come and explain to us. Why are you desperate to steal? These are our common resources. We are part of the system. We don't have property rights on it. You're declaring your property rights to our family. Tell us why you are so desperate. They didn't come, but we, they also sent letters to the WTO. And the director general of WTO came looking for me. I said, why are you looking for me? The letters didn't come from me. They came from communities. Go meet the communities under the banyan tree. 6,000 communities wrote to him and said, this is not your jurisdiction. You are sitting in Geneva and declaring that our seats belong to cooperation? No, this jurisdiction is ours as part of an earth family. That is how we have to move our rights of nature. Yeah? Recognizing the rights of nature and then defending them. Yeah, that's a very important reminder. Yeah, the rights of nature and then, and then power come from the grassroots. Yeah, mm -hmm. answer to the people's voice. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Um, so there's a question from Hong So. Yeah. Thanks, doctor, for your kind advice. So there are two questions. Uh, the first one is, what about people actually can choose kind of food and supply chains, such as humans can be meatless physically or to choose cultured cell meat since the past 10 years. The second question is, planted-based food can be dominated the meat-based world sooner for ecological succession? Well, you know, because like I said, food is a currency, you know, it flows. When you look at the impact of your eating on the ecosystem and biodiversity, you must look at the flow throughout. What happened to the flow? So just to say meat versus plant-based, you can then go to an impossible burger. Im impossible burger was made of Roundup resistant soya. So eating Roundup, you're eating GMO soya, 
you're eating him uh you know the the artificial blood that was made for this burger you are eating a product which has 14 patents associated with it yeah so is that a more desirable option than a non-violent relationship with animals not everyone doesn't eat meat i don't but there are many cultures that do. I mean, I, I was in uh, Iceland. Hmm. And, you know, someone asked a question like this. And the people of Iceland said, no, Greenland, sorry, in Greenland, because it's all snow. They said, you want us to eat vegetables when we can't grow vegetables in this ice? Hmm. We can only eat our fish life, our reindeer, you know? So we've got to be realistic. In that context, that is the most ecological nonviolent option. To impose, I think to be culturally ignorant is not a helpful way to move on these issues. We need to be respectful of life on earth. We need to be respectful of other cultures. Another example, even more, you know, the farmland is only where water is that's where you can grow food but take Mong mongolia yeah it has pastoralists tibet pastoralists rajasthan pastoralists sahara pastoralists all of these dry areas where we cannot grow food because of lack of water the animals can graze because the grass is dispersed and with a little bit of rain the grass comes back now, pastoralists are a very big community. And pastoralists live with animals. The Maasai of Africa, most beautiful people. And now you know what they're doing? Talk, I mean, for those who, who you know, think plant-based. The Maasai are a dairy culture. Tall, proud. Their gut microbiome is so rich that the Americans are having to do fecal transplants because the gut of the Americans is desertified. And that's where the sicknesses are coming. And you cannot sort that out without bringing the microbes back. And the way they're solving that problem is to do fecal transplants. The shit of the Maasai is put in the gut of the Americans. These are fecal transplants. So, like I said, we need to look at it in the whole. You know, what's happening to human health? What's happening to animals and our relationship with them? How are we treating, I mean, indigenous people of, across the world live with animals, respect them, worship them, take their permission. And then they tell, I mean, I know tribes in India where they pray to the herd and, the, and they say the herd tells us you can have this animal. Because for them, it's sacred. Same for the bison, yeah? The, they eat the bison, but the bison tells them this particular one is the one you can eat now. And then they'll have a bison and share it across the community because it's too much meat for one family. And there's ceremonies and there's celebration. So, Key is relationship. Come, we come back to the issue of consciousness. Thinking of food as a segregated, objectified consumption entity misses the fact that it's the currency of life, misses the fact that it's the relationship of life. And that's why we must be much more conscious about how the food system weaves together, how the food web weaves together, not supply chains, but the food web. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, um, so there's another question from Gary Aides. Um, thank you for your crusade on behalf of humankind. I hope you can all do a little bit to follow your big foot steps. Is the gut flora that we need to bring back equilibrium and health 
present only in the soil of a healthy forest? Well, you know, all, all life emerges out of the right context. So I have seen dead soils and we do the right thing, the right care for the soil. Our soil was a dead soil on the Navdanya farm. It used to be a eucalyptus plantation. It had absolutely killed the soil. And now our soil is so rich, even the scientists get dazed at the level of our diversity of bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi. So we haven't seen this. We didn't create these organisms. We gave love to the soil and the soil created these organisms. The same goes for the gut. You eat diverse, non-toxic food, the gut flora will come back on their own. You cannot endure them. Even though the same industry that has given us sickness is wanting to engineer one microbe at a time. Our gut, it, you cannot do it. It's an ecosystem. It's a microbiome. Just like they're trying to engineer the climate you know, with geoengineering. And I always say, if pollution was the reason for climate change, more pollution intentionally done is not a solution. So the two mentalities that are clashing, one is mastery, you know, nature is dead, it's an object, we can manipulate it. And the second is manipulating through engineering that we, the nature is a machine, so we can engineer the machine. But the reality is the earth is living. We are part of the earth. The earth is self-organized. She cannot be engineered, but the right relationships can heal. Mm. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, there's a question from Chris. Um, thank you, Dr. Vandana Shiva. What do you think what do you think uh, about hydroponic farming? Is it a farming method for the future? It seems to break the connections between nature. Yeah. So actually there's a very big movement that basically is saying you cannot call hydroponic organic because organic is about the health of the soil. It begins with measuring how healthy the soil is. Mm -hmm. That's what organic means. So to put a label organic on hydroponic is not truly organic. And there's a big issue going on in certification systems all over the world. Mm. Uh, now, the two questions I've always asked of those who promote hydroponic is my assessment of why industrial agriculture went wrong was it had all of this excessive energy use through external inputs. 10 units of external input are put in to produce one unit of food. In ecological systems, one unit produces 10 units of food. And that's the big thing. So who's producing? The farmers aren't there. They're called energy slaves. Three times the population of people are the energy slaves we are using through this hidden energy use. The energy that get, is in the fertilizers, the energy that is in running these hydroponic systems. It's very energy intensive. So I've always asked them, I said, tell me how much energy you use. Mm. You remember? The mm. second I've said is, show me, if we know the phytochemicals and micronutrients come from the soil, mm. just like industrial farming believe nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium is all that you need, and they pumped the soil with nitrogen, but then we found out it needs everything. Mm. But hydroponics, yes, they can add a few elements of chemicals in the liquid that is used, but they cannot add all because so many are produced by the organisms themselves. Mm. So I've always said, just like in chemical agriculture, we lost, we've lost 70% of the nutrition. What is the nutrition in these foods? Not the mass. Mass is a Cartesian measure. Mm. Nutrition and energy and life-giving systems. You know, in Chinese medicine, you have the concept of life-giving energies. In, in Indian systems, we have the idea, we differentiate between energies that kill and energy that give life. Mm. So it's important to understand two things, the energy audit and the nutrition. 
And those two factors are missing till I get that. I will not blindly call it organic. Mm. Yep, I agree. <laughs> mm. Mm. Um. So there's a question from uh, Sili Life Farm. I think somebody uh, running a farm. Yeah. The first, oh, three questions. The first question is for the seeds keep humans healthy, do you mean that the soil keeps the seeds healthy and thus the food healthy and thus the humans healthy? Can you tell us more? Yeah. So uh, humans, you know, in forest soils, the forest does it all. But in agricultural soils, humans have a role. Humans have to care for the soil and care for the seed. Then the soil will be living and the seed will be living through the care. Because otherwise, you know, you can destroy the seed in one season if you don't ensure it is the right moisture that can be conserved and kept for the next season. So you have to care for the living systems need care. Machines don't need care. Living systems need care, you have to give. So humans have to give care. And then in return, the living soil and the living seed, yes, makes the soil healthy, the seed healthy, the plant healthy, and humans healthy. Then the cycle gets maintained. We have to be part of that cycle. Mm. Okay. Um, maybe uh, from this uh, uh, city life, I think I will skip the second question and go to the third one. Yeah, and so is it China's uh, Yuan Longping, uh, who is loved, uh, I think it's a, um, a hybrid rice name, yeah, uh, who is loved by the Chinese for his hybrid rice engineering technology that has been dramatically increased food production. Will his technology also weaken food nutrition? Well, I think the studies need to be done on the hybrid. Usually hybrids need a lot of chemical fertilizers. They need a lot mm. of water. And, uh, and yes, they have hybrid vigor that you can, you know, that first season of boost you have in yield, that's why you have high yield. But the next mm. season you have a collapse, mm. which is why hybrids can't be saved. So it is not true seed in the sense, Seed means that which can renew itself season after season after season. Bija is the name for seed in Indian language. Bija means bija mm. means that in which life, ja is life. Bija is that in which life arises again and again and again on its own in autopoiesis, in its own creation. Mm. Yeah, that's seed. But if I do a hybrid bigger, but the farmer has to buy seed every year, mm -hmm. that's where systems start. And two things happen. First, if, if uh, I said 200,000, we say 4,000 rice varieties. If I get rid of that rice diversity, I've got rid of a large part of life. Yeah. So hybrids then displace life. But I think the key issue that I've learned from 1984 onwards is we cannot apply the mechanistic, Baconian, Newtonian, Cartesian approach to the very basis of life, which is food. We have to apply an ecological mind, a conscious mind. And that is how even the technologies have to be shaped from that larger consciousness. Mm. Yep, great. And yeah. one more little footnote to okay. that. Yeah. Uh, you know, just like China had this massive trading system, you know, the Silk Route, India had all the spice trade. We were a big part of the world economy. We were 25% of the world economy. Mm -hmm. Then the British created colonialism and they defined economy as what they create. In a similar way, we, you know, China used to weave, we used to weave the most beautiful fabrics. That too was a technology. It was all on looms hand woven, beautiful. With the finding of coal and the steam and, you know, and the, uh, they were able, they put the factory, but they'd also taken the land of America, taken the slaves from Africa, et cetera. They industrialized textile production. 
And with the industrialization of textile production, they could start destroying and dumping. They, they took all the cotton from the world and then dumped and, and destroyed our textiles. Technology was made to look like industry alone. In my understanding, technology is about transformation. It's a tool. Nature has her technology. Look at the amazing technology of taking the sunlight through photosynthesis, giving us food, giving us oxygen to breathe. That's why we are the earth, because the earth makes us. That's a technology. People have technologies. Mm -hmm. Women have technologies. Mm -hmm. To deny all of that and only treat tools of non-renewability, tools of monopoly, tools of, um, of increasing the toxic load on the planet, and call those technologies and deny the role status of technologies to others, that is part of the colonial patriarchal bias. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, all right. Uh, because of the time, uh, we have only a few minutes left. So maybe um, this is the last questions that we can. Um, I we we, we hope that um, Dr. Shiva can uh, answer. So this is from Leon Ivano Mar. Oh, this his question. Second question. So, what are the most important beliefs and habits? you identify to coming back towards unity with nature? Oh, a very good question. <laughs> to recognize that we are not separate from nature. Uh, to put, change our consciousness. Secondly, to put that consciousness into practice through mm. our daily actions. Mm. If you can, like you do, Zuni, grow your food. If you mm. can't, Relate to someone who grows their food so you are eating food that is grown with love and care. Just those two things start mm. to have huge impact on the world. And this will become more and more important because, you know, the tech giants have decided that they want to take over our food now. They want to reduce food to patterns. Someone to ask that question about the cellular. No, you know, even the cellular meat requires food. And the feedstock requirement of these lab produced systems will be much more than the food we eat directly. Because it will be taking the monoculture production even further. Why did the Green Revolution go wrong? We used to grow rice with ducks. We used mm. to grow yeah. wheat with pulses and legumes which fix the nitrogen. That mixture produces more, as I said, health per acre, nutrition per acre produces more, using less land. Then every time we've done this, we've expanded the area we need. We didn't reduce the area, even though it was called more efficient, more productive, we use this land, it's land saving, totally false. We use more land because we regen weren't regenerating the land. We were growing one crop, which is very inefficient in terms of harvesting the sunshine. Mm. Now you want to have large acreages. Monsanto and Bayer are already ready with this. They're saying, we will now shift agriculture to farming without, Mr. Gates says this, farming without farmers, food without farms. Now the farms will produce raw material for the lab food and the factory food. Mm. It's not that they'll disappear but farmers will disappear. And the buyer has said, we will now grow raw material of amino acids and proteins. But as I mentioned, the diversity of nutrition is what we need and what our gut needs. So you're reducing the food to the cellular meat to just carbohydrates and a few proteins. Mm. What again will be the nourishing quality of this. You know, the health element is missing totally. But the relationship between us and food is health. Mm. So there are too many unanswered questions. But the one thing as intelligent human beings we should do 
is learn if we know ultra processed food has caused the 75% of the chronic diseases, well, what will more processing in the lab do to our health system? If energy use has, you know, the reason some of these cellular meat companies are collapsing is they're very energy intensive and the energy use is shooting up and the price of energy is shooting up, they're having to close up. Then one of my next books will be on these issues. That's a non-sustainable system because the only sustainable systems are those which generate their own energy and their own growth. A plant generates its own energy. Human beings generate their own energy. Good food generates energy. So many, many, many question marks about future and we should maintain the consciousness, the knowledge, the wisdom, the tools, to make the best choices for the earth and fellow human beings. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the wonderful talk and also the um, answers to all these uh, um, meaningful questions. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think the last part, I think I uh, bring back to the word Shakti. <laughs> so yeah, and the power to act to create, I think that is the very important um, keyword or uh, um, values that we need to put into practice. Yeah, and then reclaim our shati, rebuild our earth. I think that is a very important um, message that I, we have um, received from Dr. Shiva's uh, talk today, yeah. Okay, um, sorry that there are other questions and uh, that just they were written in the chat box, but we don't have time to answer every uh, all of them. Yeah, so um, before we end, so uh, there's there are a few notes that we need to um, we'd like to share uh, with you, uh, all about um, the forthcoming uh, activities that you might be interested to join. So the first one is a uh, from about um, Satish. Yeah, I, I think some of you also uh, attended uh, the talk by Satish uh, a month ago, a while ago. Yeah, <laughs> yo. So he's also coming to Hong Kong. Uh, so um, in October, there's a residential retreat. Yeah, with uh, him. Uh, so if you want to join. Uh, you can you can scan the what's it called the the QR code, <laughs> and if you are a reader uh, reading books uh, um, of Satish, you can also join the reading club. Um, uh, so it's a kind of reading uh, books together organized by the KEP. Yeah, and then there are two more talks coming up under this uh, series. Um, the first one is by David uh, Abram, yeah, and between the body and the breathing earth. So it's, it will take place in July 15, um, 1.30 to 4, uh, to 3, Hong Kong time. And uh, and the other one is by Om Shunisa, um, yeah, coexist, coexisting and co-creating with the more than human world. It will take place take place in September the 7th, yeah, um, from 6 to 8.30 Hong Kong time. Yeah, so uh, they, I, I believe that but these are wonderful talks that um, you may want to join, yeah. And then there's another um, message from the Kaduri Farm, uh, and also uh, there is a membership program that, uh, they want invite you to join, yeah, to support the uh, work, uh, the conservation of work um, of the Kaduri farm. So please also scan the QR code for the details. Yeah. And then the last one is about uh, the questionnaire. So um, uh, Please also scan the QR code here uh, to uh, fill in a survey for this talk. Uh, I think it will give uh, very um, important feedback and information for uh, the, the uh, Kaduri Farm 
colleagues to improve their work. Yeah, so uh, please do that. And also, they will also, um, I think the recording will be also put into, uh, will be, uh, the link will be sent to you through emails uh, for those who have uh, registered for this talk. Yeah. And uh, and also it was also will also be uploaded to the KFBG YouTube. Okay, so thank you very much for joining us this time, and look forward to seeing you in other occasions. And thank you very much, Dr. Shiver. Yeah, hope thank you to see you thank in you. person and or in India soon. Yeah. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so much for now. Yeah, okay. Thank you, everybody. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Come to Hong Kong, Thank Dr. Vandana Shiva. We love you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.